I am Rachel Humphrey with DEI Advisors. We are a nonprofit organization out of Arizona empowering personal success in the hospitality industry. And I am delighted to welcome to the show today, Noreen Henry. Noreen, welcome. Thanks, Rachel. I'm so excited to be here with you. Thank you for the invitation. For those who are listening who are not familiar with Noreen or her background or her bio, we hope you'll head over to DEI Advisors and read a little bit more about her. But for now, we're going to jump right in. And Noreen, you've um, listened to the show before others have as well, who know that one of the fascinating things I find in the hospitality industry is how unique everybody's path to leadership is. There's not one route that everybody has to take. So tell us a little bit about you, your background, and how you ended up where you are today. Uh, sure. So uh, unlike some of the other ones, I, as I have listened to your um, podcast, which I really have been enjoying, so thank you for those. Uh, I stumbled into this industry um, unintentionally, but immediately fell in love. So um, I majored in college in communications with a focus on radio, TV, film. So you're like, what are you doing with that degree? <laughs> in this industry? Um, but I got my first job working for Sabre, working for a, a very innovative uh, tech leader named Terry Jones. And he was always on the leading edge of technology. And he, this is, this will show my age, this is back in the 80s, late 80s, uh, when travel agents were booking hotels by using that big hotel travel index uh, or brochures, like they didn't have images online. And so the product was called Saber Vision. It was about bringing images to the travel agents so that they could be able to, you know, book travel more effectively. And I, that started my journey of this, place of having travel and technology and in particular focus on hospitality be the place that I have just thrived and I love. So, you know, fast forward, I spent 12 years at Sabre and this is the early year. So I am just learning all kinds of skills as I can and trying to just be a sponge learning from everybody else. Um, the next technology wave was the internet. So, you know, late 90s, I made a very intentional career decision to leave Sabre, which I had adored and loved, and they treated me really well. But I wanted to get onto this new technology and see what's going on in the Internet. And I went and worked for a company called Netscape. And I also wanted to get new skills. I wanted sales experience. I was finding that I was thriving and loving being with customers and getting that client interaction. But at Sabre, I started my career really in product. And so you know, developing products that were for customers, but not actually being the one selling them. And so I kind of was pigeonholed and I'm like, I got to get out of this to get the experience that I want. So I left, spent three years really learning. This is a startup, you know, boom phase of the internet. And so I've got some great experience. And then uh, Travelocity was coming about. And so it gave me the chance to come back to travel with internet in a startup, again, working for Terry Jones since he was the founder of Travelocity. And, um, you know, I consider this kind of like the second phase of my career where I really just, um, so this was my leadership phase. You know, I really learned about the business. I learned um, how to do different functions. So I, you know, I call it the spiral staircase. So like mm -hmm. I did operations, I did marketing, I did, I leveraged that sales background. And Travelocity was growing leaps and bounds at the time. and this will give you an idea of like the trajectory of the company when I was uh, there. So I started the first market management team. So uh, this is shortly after 9-11 and we we're getting into our own hotel merchant business. And uh, it's funny to think of this now. We had five market managers covering all of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> but this is us. OK, we're going to get into this business and figure it out. Well, you know, fast forward 12 years later, I'm back out in the field running this field organization that now is a 400 person organization with market managers and sales and operations. And uh, it was just so fun to be part of a company that was growing leaps and bounds um, over that uh, 12 years and the journey that I was able to take with that. The last phase then um, is what I kind of consider my executive phase. So with Travelocity being acquired by Expedia, I'm like, okay, I've spent 12 years. This is kind of all I know. I was like scared about what was going to be the next phase, the next chapter. And, uh, I took an educational sabbatical. Um, I spent two months. I went to a Harvard uh, management program, leadership program. It was life changing for me. It gave me the skills and the confidence that I needed to go face this next chapter. And this next chapter really was about, you know, different C-level roles. That's really, really where I wanted to go. So I did a number of different companies after that. One of the companies was um, Wayblazer, where I was the CEO. That was a company also founded by Terry Jones. You'll find there's a consistent thread <laughs> in my career here. 
um, had an amazing experience there. And eventually it led to my current role where I'm the chief revenue officer at Sojourn. So I feel very blessed to have had this journey um, and always be on you know, technology and how it helps the industry and in particular how it helps hotels. Well, so many incredible lessons in there and some I want to talk about a little bit later, but the idea of having a really broad base of knowledge across your company, taking a risk and leaving something comfortable to step out to something not, expanding your education to see what else is out there, having a champion interior. I mean, so, so much incredible advice there. Um, really appreciate your sharing that. I also like to share with our audience why I have asked you to join us as an advisor um, and talk about that for a minute. One of the interesting things for me is you're actually very new to my universe. Our paths had not crossed until recently in serving on the advisory board for Women in Travel Thrive Together. And what after a few meetings that we were in together and listening to you, it reminded me how important it is for our networks and our relationships to be outside of maybe the lane that we are in. Because here is somebody, you, in our industry, in an executive role, who I have so much to learn from in an area I know literally nothing about. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to learn from, network, build relationships with other people in other facets of this industry. And so um, I wanted to say thank you for that because it's a good reminder for me at this stage of, of my career. But it also leads me to asking you a couple questions about being involved with boards, associations, nonprofits. You spend a tremendous time volunteering and serving the community. And one of the great things about that is not just the giving back, which makes a lot of us feel good, but is actually the ability to acquire completely new skills or different leadership techniques when you are taken outside of your day job. Can you talk a little bit about your roles there, your service, and how that has helped you define you as a leader? Sure. Um, and I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to get a chance to meet you through Women in Travel Thrive. Uh, like I'll, I'll start with that organization. I'll talk about some of the other ones, but like, I love that organization. And I, what I find really beneficial whenever I spend time volunteering and helping is not only do I feel good about, hey, I'm able to help an organization and, and leverage some of my skills, but I get so much in return by doing that. Um, you know, th this group of women, they're so passionate about what they're trying to accomplish. And you know, I first met Sylvia and the ladies, and uh, I consider them the, the girls that just get stuff done. Like, there we are. <laughs> I'm, I'm blown away by how much they get done and how accomplished. And, and I get so much energy from them. So I'm, I got sucked in. I'm like, oh, my gosh, how can I figure out how to be a part of this organization, how to help them? And not only that, then it gave me opportunity to meet others. And so it's an opportunity to meet you, opportunity to meet others that are on the board that I haven't met before. Right. And so it expanded my network and helped me along those lines. And I have found that, and this is actually advice I give to people all along, is you know, it's really, really important to establish your network and get outside of your company. Like we spend so much time in the company and this is all we know. Yeah. I was very intentional when I set my sets on, hey, I, want, I really want to understand the hotel industry that I went into, head the organization and eventually became part of the, their board. I uh, started to partic participate in HSMAI and eventually became part of the board. Like, that's a way for me to really get to know others and then understand, you know, ultimately I'm selling to folks that are in these rooms and I, I learn more about the challenges that they're going through and how to empathize. And they see me in a different way, not just, oh, she's got a bag and she's trying to sell me something. She's actually trying to understand my problems and understand the industry and figure out how she can contribute to it. So I found it hugely valuable for my career as well as just for me personally. Yeah, that's such an important lesson. And I've had that same thing as well. Um, pivoting a little bit, when you were talking about your path to leadership, you mentioned different stages or how you define maybe different stages. Growing up as a young girl, did you always think you had leadership in your final destiny? Or was there a turning point where you're like, you know what, I actually can see myself turning into um, a leader, whether it's in this industry or this company or somewhere else? So uh, leadership was something like I always wanted from a child. Like I saw it with my parents. You know, my dad was a strong leader at his company. He became CEO. So I saw that they modeled it. They were also leaders in the community. They were leaders within the um, our church uh, organization. So I saw that. And so e e even at an early age, you know, I was 
participating in high school, um, you know, student council and running for those types of things. In college, I was, you know, leadership in the sorority. Like, I always found places that I could do that. But it's definitely different in your career. <laughs> and you've got to <laughs> really, uh, you know, learn the basics of that before you're like, oh, okay, now I'm ready for leadership. And I'll tell you, you know, when I really got passionate about leadership, not just leading a team, but like in hospitality, like how do I do it in this industry was early days at Travelocity. So going from, you know, hey, you're the expert, you know this to, hey, I got to manage a team and get these guys fired up. And we were launching our merchant hotel program um, and having us all like really focused on a mission. And for me, figuring out how am I getting rid of the obstacles and how are we actually helping the hotels during this what was a really tough time for them because it was right after 9-11. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is where I want to be a leader and I want to figure out how I just um, can excel at the space. And I dove in, I laid out a plan and went, okay, how am I going to get from here to there? And what experience do I need? I um, became, became very intentional about it. And uh, I'm really delighted that I chose that path. Well, that's such an interesting thing to hear, too, that the moment for you in realizing leadership really came in a moment of adversity. It, you know, it's, some people say it's easy to lead when everything is great and whatnot. But to really say in this moment, here's a place where we're all trying to figure it out. And yet this is where I feel like I'm really shining. What an incredible realization for you. Turning a little bit to the um, to the side of of advocating for women, being dedicated to elevating women. One of the things, the generalizations we hear a lot is that as women, we are not good at advocating for ourselves. What advice would you give to our listeners who may be struggling to really feel like they can advocate for themselves in a way that will be beneficial? Uh, sure. So um, I, I might be a little bit controversial. Like, it drives me a little bit crazy that women don't advocate for themselves. Like if you don't believe in yourself, how can you expect somebody else to advocate for you? Um, so I've always been a believer that you need to advocate for yourself. Um, you know, it's how I've secured many of the jobs that I've had. Now, what I would say is um, when you advocate, it needs to be a balance of, hey, I'm confident. And there's a reason why I'm advocating and you have your plan to justify it. But it's also being humble. Like, OK, you're advocating and maybe it might not be, you, you know, you, you may not get at the end of the day what you're asking for, but you're going to learn something by advocating and you're going to gain respect by advocating. And I'll give you a story. So I recently had a strong woman on my team um, who was advocating for herself for expanded responsibility and expanded uh, compensation to go with it. And whether at the end of the day I end up you know, accommodating that or not. I paused and I thanked her for advocating for herself. And I wanted to reinforce that that was a really good thing for her to do. Because, uh, you know, if, and it, uh, I think probably particularly in the sales role, like I expect people to be advocating for themselves because I expect you to advocate for the company when you're negotiating. Like if you're not doing it for yourselves, are you going to represent the company the right way? So I think it's a, as a leader, I think it's a terrific thing. And I think, People should realize you're going to get respect by advocating. So don't be afraid to advocate. Know that there is benefit. Even if you don't get the end result, you're going to learn from it. Others are going to learn that you're interested in something. They're going to try and find the path for you. People want to help. So please, everybody, get have confidence to go advocate for yourself. It will pay off. I love that. And I love the analogy to sales. That's so interesting because I think a lot of people are great at selling their company, selling their product, but have a tougher time when it comes to themselves. And I want to talk about that for a minute because you mentioned, um, you know, at one point being CEO, then now being chief revenue officer, certainly not in every moment. Are you, do you have the confidence? You said, you know, have the confidence in yourself. What strategies do you have when you are experiencing self-doubt about yourself, your role, your competencies, your bandwidth, whatever it is, that really help you kind of get over that stuck spot? Sure. You know, and I wish at this stage in my life, after all these years of experience, I wouldn't still experience self-doubt, but I do. Um, yeah. And we all do. And so what I try to do when I'm in the midst of that is remind myself, hey, you have been here before. <laughs> and uh, e either you belong at this table because you've been here before and you know, you've proven yourself. So I remind myself, believe in yourself. I also remind myself, 
um, you know, when I have when I have believed in myself and I have done this, it's opened up other doors and opportunities for me. It might even be different than what I thought. So like get yourself at that table, overcome the self doubt. And the, if I'm still not there, I, I remind myself like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? <laughs> the worst thing that might happen is you might fail. Well, you know what? I, I have failed before. I have failed publicly before and I'm okay. I actually came away from that stronger and people respected what I learned from it. So I have to remind myself that sometimes, honestly, because failure is still scary. And I got to go, it's okay. You you know, you need to believe in yourself. And you need to put yourself out there. And I, I push myself to go do it. Well, and think about that too, Noreen. Even at this chapter of your life, it's okay to say, I have self-doubt or failure is scary or I'm not, you know, I have to convince myself that I belong here. So as earlier careers are experiencing that, that's nothing to detract from what path you may be able to be on. And I think that that's great advice to everyone. One other piece of advice we hear a lot is surrounding yourself with people who see the true you and can help you overcome some of those self-doubt. So if you're experiencing self-doubt and you can't redirect yourself, you've got a team around you, not of people who just build you up. Sometimes they're going to give you the honest truth, but who can really help you with that. Do you rely heavily on a support system? How do you identify the people that you select to be on your personal board? Yeah, I, I definitely have a support system. I, I kind of consider them my tribe, um, my, my trusted tribe that I can go to for advice and counsel. And it consists of, of you know, folks that I have worked with in the past, so they know me from the work world and they know, you know, how I've they might be the ones that remind me how I've overcome something. <laughs> Here's what I typically see of you, Nori. This is the way for you to handle it. Um, I also have folks who are outside the industry because I think it's helpful that, you know, folks who haven't necessarily seen me there and they've got a different perspective. And I'll, I'll tell you, one of those is actually my sister. So my sister is an executive in a different industry. She's in software translation. And like, she's somebody I can be completely vulnerable with. You know, I can have my tearing cry up. Oh my God, how am I ever going to do this? Uh, <laughs> melt down with her. She lets me melt down and then she helps pick me up. And she, you know, either is encouraging and, you know, gives me the, the confidence that I need, or sometimes she gives me the kick in the butt and like, hey, you know, the, you know, toughen up buttercup. This is your, you know, <laughs> face this and go figure this thing out. Or she also helps me when it's time for me to take a change. Like, okay, you're at a point here, sister, that you need to make a transition in your life because this is not the right thing for you. And so I think it really helps if you have someone who can be that honest with you. Um, and so I, I'm grateful for her and I'm grateful for the rest of those who support me. And so I highly encourage everybody to make sure you have those trusted confidence that you can you know, be completely yourself with. Mm, that's great advice. And you talked earlier about having failures, even some very public failures, not any executive reaches the level you have without some setbacks or challenges along the way and continues to, you know, on a regular basis in this or any other industry. Do you have a process you go through when you're faced with a challenge and obstacle of how you navigate that and how you reflect back on it? So, um, I do, and I've definitely encountered a lot of different obstacles in my life. And I'll tell you, I, I recently wrote, I think it was last year, I wrote a blog about um, training for a marathon and like the lessons that I learned from doing a marathon and how I apply them to work. Because I found that there's tons of obstacles when you're trying to do a really big, hairy, lofty goal. And I, I was able to simplify it from that experience. And you know, for, for me, it's a couple of things. It's like, you have to have, if you're trying to accomplish something, you have to have a really big plan. How are you going to get from here to there? You can't just get there and you have to, you know, execute doggedly. Like you can't skip days. You got to go after it, <laughs> but you're going to hit those obstacles. You're going to hit the wall. You're going to have injuries. You're going to have all those things in your career that you have, like when you're training and you have to ask for help. You have to, you know, look for experts who are going to help guide you along that. And you have to respect the obstacle. We call it in, in uh, running, like, re respect the wall. You're going to hit a wall. You're going to hit that wall. You have to respect it and go, what do I need to do to get around this? You pause, you take a break, you pull back, you take a look at it. Sometimes, you know, you're in the midst of it and you're just overwhelmed by what that obstacle is. And if you pull back, get advice from others, reassess it yourself. 
you're going to help figure out what are your solutions to work around it. Um, and my big advice uh, to, to others and to myself is don't let that derail you. Like it's easy to then just go, okay, these obstacles are too much and I can't get past them and I'm, I'm just not going to go forward. And don't, there is a way around it. You got to just take the time to figure it out what's the best solution. And then once you do get past that obstacle, celebrate your success, you know, acknowledge that you were successful here and, and acknowledge the small successes along the way because they helped get you to this point. So um, everyone's going to encounter them. Just you need to take the time to figure out how you're going to work through them. I love the concept of celebrating successes too, because we can be so hard on ourselves when things do not go how we or others want them to, but we really gloss over very quickly, if at all, any successes that we have. So that's wonderful advice. And your marathon running, well, I cannot relate to that in any way, because every step I take running, I wonder how many more I have to take before I can <laughs> get chocolate cake or something at the end of the day. Um, it does bring up two things that I would love to ask you about. Coming out of the pandemic, especially, there's been a renewed focus on self-care and wellness. And we are hearing so many more people talk about the prioritization. I have said before that in retirement, it is probably the most important thing that I have learned is that self-care is not selfish, that it's a really critical part of our, our, our growth and our leadership. Talk about self-care and wellness for you, the role it plays. Has that evolved over time? And what would you tell um, others who are listening who maybe aren't carving out the time for that? Uh, so it's, it is a huge part for me. Like it is rare for me to not take time out of every day for my health and well-being. So whether that's running, whether that's paddleboarding, whatever it is, I need some kind of mechanism that's going to help charge me. Not only is it good for me physically, but it's really good for me mentally. Like my husband, was, he, he could tell like if I've gone a couple of days without running, like he could just see that stress levels building up. He's like, <laughs> Babe, I, I think you need to go. I think you need to get out there. So, and, and so like part of it is, you know, for me personally, the other part I would say is it has opened up my network outside of work. Like it's a way to connect with others. And so, you know, I've got a running group that I run with on Saturday mornings and they're my therapy session. You know, you're, you're spending that much time running these long distances and they become your support mechanism as well. And I also hear their stories from out the week. And, and I discover like, you know, my life's not so bad when I hear some of their stories. <laughs> Teachers, oh my gosh, they have a challenging job. So oh my um, goodness. yeah, so like, I, I think it's really good, you know, for you, for, for you to, to, figure out how you carve that time out. Um, and for me, it's just been really important. And I'll, I'll tell you my, my secret on it has been, it started when my, uh, when I had my first newborn and I was waking up really early in the morning to feed them. And once they started sleeping through, I was still waking up early. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is my quiet time before anybody needs me. So mm -hmm. I became a early morning workout person because I could carve out that quiet time just for myself. Oh my God, that's fantastic. And pivots perfectly into work-life <laughs> harmony. You know, we hear a lot, again, a renewed focus on people. And I think, you know, when, when you initially hear about work-life balance, most people think you're talking about parenting, but it can actually be spouse or hobbies or health or many, many other things. How do you find time or do you find time? How do you think you've been at finding a balance? You know, you've had a very... Um, incredible career with a lot of demands, a lot of trajectory, a lot of travel and managing big teams, different time zones, all of these other things that can really blend um, time for you. How do you manage or, or find harmony in that space? So I really like that you use the word harmony because that's a word that I use as well. I don't know that it's balance, like it's harmony. How do We spend so much time at work. So first, make sure it's a job you love and that it's people that you want to work with that helps with the whole harmony of uh, embracing that for the rest of your life. Um, for me, it's also been, uh, you know, I have an incredibly supportive spouse. You know, my, my husband understands the challenges that I have and he's able to be, to be flexible. When the kids were young, he actually was a stay at home dad for a while. Like we looked at our careers and said, okay, how are we going to balance this? But then with all of my travels, he then would join my travel. We figured out how do we take advantage of my travels for work to also have travels for the family and travels for him. And so we blend a lot. 
But I would say, I, you know, I also really make sure that I do carve out specific time for family. Like you have to, which word, it's not just quantity of time with your children. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not just quality, it's quantity. Like you have to be there, not just for the special moments, but you have to be there for the regular moments and the day to day and hear what their stories are. And so you have to shut off work and carve out the time for the kids. When I was traveling a ton when they were little, you know, this is before, before all the gaming really took off, like <laughs> we would talk for hours on a conference call playing checkers and stuff. And I hear all the stories of the day while I'm playing with them. And it was just, you know, it's crazy that those are still my special memories, even though I'm, you know, states away having me, this time with them, I found a way that I was still going to connect with them even when I was on the road. I like the intentionality of it too. We can't assume that when we travel just by picking up the phone and and checking in that that's going to feel connection. But I like your strategy of being very intentional and in how you were doing that. When you were talking about your path to leadership, you talked about the decision to leave a place that you were very comfortable, you were very successful, you were learning a lot. And by the way, fun fact, my mother was a travel agent in the days that you were talking about. So I can relate to what you were talking in the 80s. So I can relate to what you're talking about there. Right. But you did take a big risk in saying, okay, I, this is good. I could be good here forever, or I could take a big risk and change. How do you tackle risks, evaluate? How do you know, okay, this is a risk I am going to take. And maybe this one I'm, could be good, but I'm gonna pass on this. Um, yeah, I did. I did take some very intentional risks in my career and, and got outside of my comfort zone. And the way I evaluated it was, you know, first it was, what is my long term plan? Where do I want to be? And can I get where I want to be where I'm at? Or do I have to make a change to be able to do that? And then if I'm going to make a change, I want to make sure that I'm going to accomplish the things that I want to accomplish. What skill gaps am I going to get by making this change? What am I going to learn? And make sure that the change that I'm doing aligns with that. So I don't want to change just for change's sake. You know, when I when I left Sabre, it was I want to get in an experience and I want to get sales experience. I am pigeonholed here. I've got to go figure that out. And, you know, people thought I was crazy. Like, you're like, you're this great company, blah, blah, blah. Yes, but... And if I didn't take that risk, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I wouldn't have got that sales experience. I wouldn't have, you know, et cetera. I think about, you know, the, my time at Wayblazer. And so that was a risk to go to this small startup company. I was the second CEO. They had limited funding. And, you know, unfortunately, ultimately, the startup did not make it. But I learned so much from doing that. And what I thought was really interesting about that one, you know, I, I talk about that, that's my public failure. Like everybody knows <laughs> that startup did not make it. But, you know, in interviewing afterwards for roles, everybody wanted to understand what did you learn? And they appreciated that I took that risk. And, you know, board members, they know not everything is going to be successful. Those were the questions that I was getting asked when I was interviewing. And so I value that experience and, and value the fact that I took that risk. That's great that's really advice. Well, as expected, I could talk to you for hours. I have so many more things I want to learn from you, but we are winding down on time. And my favorite question to always be asked and to ask in return is advice to our younger selves. And it's because I really think that we are all works in progress, but reflection is a really important part of personal growth. So what does Noreen today tell radio and TV college major Noreen, either about how things would work out or something you wish you knew then that might have um, been instrumental in your path? Uh, the advice I would tell myself, and I have since told my children this, is take a breath. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> slow down smell the roses you know I think in college you know I'm like just this overachiever and you know I have to finish college in three years and oh two weeks later I gotta go get married and I gotta start a new job and like holy cow I look back and then I'm like what why, <laughs> why didn't you slow down a little bit and enjoy your time because that was your best time to be able to do that right. And so I think I miss out on some opportunities by just driving too hard at times. And so just take a breath, enjoy life, enjoy what you have going on, appreciate it. I love that. And then keeping in mind the motto of DEI advisors to empower personal success, do you have any final tidbits you'd share with our audience, any final pieces of advice? 
Yeah, and it's probably something I've kind of weaved throughout the conversation here. And it's really own your career. You know, don't, mm. don't let your career just be you, you're in the back seat of letting it drive. You be in that front seat. Know where you want to go. Know the navigation. Now, different windows are going to open along the way. My dad used to always talk about that. This window's passing. Are you going to jump through or you're not going to jump through? You have to evaluate <laughs> that. But, you know, own your career and be intentional. Understand that path and then be very intentional about those different moves that you want to make. So that would be my advice. Well, that's a great place for us to wrap up today. So Noreen, thank you so much for joining us, sharing your story, some of the insights you've learned along the way. And thank you so much for your leadership and your advocacy in our industry. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for the time. And, and I appreciate all the things that you guys are doing at DI Advisor. So and I'm happy to be part of this. Thank you so much. And to our audience, thank you so much for listening today. We hope you'll head over to deiadvisors.org and hear from over 100 industry leaders who have also shared their stories and their insights they've learned along the way. You can also stream us on your favorite podcast streaming service. Thank you so much, Norton.